welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for being here today. So um, if you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, I would love it if you would do so. And if you have, thank you so much and welcome back. So today I'm very excited to be talking about fragrances from the 80s. And I will get into that in a moment. I want to talk about my scent of the day. <laughs> But my scent of the day today comes in this interesting bottle from Selena Gomez. And you know what? I don't even know if it's just called Selena. I think it's just called Selena Gomez. Um, this was a recommendation from Curious Perfumer. I really like her channel and I really like this. So I picked this up upon her recommendation and because one of the fragrances I'm going to be talking about today was with this order. And so it's interesting. It reminds me a lot of our beloved... Onika from Nicki Minaj. And so this is really nice. And thank you to Curious Perfumer for this recommendation. It's really nice. Um, so it's a floral fruity, in my opinion. Okay, so 80s. So the 80s, of course, were the era of big hair, big shoulder pads, um, lots of blush, blue eyeshadow going all the way up to here, <laughs> wall bangs, and um, lots of eyeliner. So that's, that's my recollection anyway, <laughs> as well as very powerful fragrances. So I'm gonna be going a little bit chronologically here and I'm kind of excited because it's fun. It's fun to smell this stuff and it, it brings back memories. It's probably not stuff I wanna wear too much of except with some exceptions, but I am going to start with 1981 and Giorgio. Oh, I forgot to mention. So I recently in my Calvin Klein video, I used these books because I love these books. This is, um, they're both from Luca Turin and Tanya Sanchez. This one is from 2008 and it's called Perfumes the A to Z Guide. And this one is from 2018 and it's called Perfumes the Guide. Love these. Um, I'll link that um, Calvin Klein video in the cards. So I'm just gonna read some little excerpts because they actually, I think they cover all of these, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think they do cover all of them, which is awesome. Mostly, obviously, from this book. So, okay. So we've got Giorgio, which came out in 1981. This, like, has things, this has, like, a caution. It's this flammable sticker on it, which my, most of my perfumes don't come with. So I don't know why this is especially flammable. It's a very powerful, powerful perfume. <laughs> so, um, and I haven't sprayed it yet, and I'm going to... Um, I did just kind of smell it. It smells exactly like I remember um, I'm gonna spray it into the cap. It smells exactly like I remember. It's just, um, whoa. It's a beast mode. Um, I'm gonna look in the book. It's a beast mode and it's, um, I think it's kind of cool. I don't know if I would wear it now. I don't think I would. It's just, okay, so it got four stars, fruity tuberose, it is considered polite to deplore the excesses of the 80s and to trot out opium, poison, and Giorgio as exhibits, much as one would disapprove of Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero and welcome the return to sanity represented by the Claudius 90s school of fragrance, pinched, mean, and full of sour probity. <laughs> Yet insofar as perfume is more circuses than bread, I suspect many people harbor a sneaking fondness for the bad old days. Um, upon revisiting the scoundrels for this guide, I was struck by the fact that the problem was not that one was tired of cheap magic, witness the fact that Angel came later and did very well, and insolence carries on the tradition, but that a new style was needed. Surprise fades fastest of all the emotions, and what is amazing is how long these contrivances kept us interested. The secret of Giorgio was the discovery of an accord that could stand up to a monstrously powerful tuberose while extending it in interesting directions two heroically strong arom aroma chemicals were drafted. So it's, <laughs> you know, there's something soapy about it. Um, they don't mention that, but there's just something very soapy. Um, so I don't know, I might have to take this for a test run since I'm I'm not going anywhere. So um, it's, uh, it's exactly how I remember it. I remember they came out with those Primo clones in the kind of um, dry shampoo like canister bottles. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? So what are your favorite 80s fragrances? I would love to hear down in the comments. Okay, the next one I've talked about a little bit on the channel and that's Paris from YSL. And this is another very powerful and 
I think it's beautiful. Um, and I wore this, oh, and Paris came out in 1983. A YSL Paris Roaring Rose. Fragrance, along with fashion and music, reached an unprecedented level of bombast in the 80s. The shoulder pads were wide, the hair was big, the music was mindless. I beg to differ, there's some good music. And the perfume was far, far too strong, which is why everyone in the 90s took to wearing CK1 and L'Odyssé as a sort of olfactory fast to atone for years of overdoing it. To this day, many people believe they hate perfume because they only remember the poisons, the opiums, the Giorgios, and Paris, the zenith or nadir, depending on how you look at it, of the perfumer's rose. The word on this fragrance is that it is a rose composed of ions, those wonderful materials that smell fruity, powdery, and powdery and woody all at once. Spray Paris on paper and it exhales an intense, rich, wine-like breath. It comes off as more of a vast bouquet than a solo floor. Okay, he goes on. So, um, yes, Paris is very strong and very floral, and I think it's very beautiful. So, this was definitely one of my favorites back in the day. I never actually owned Giorgio. Lots of other people did, though, that's for sure. I definitely smelled it. And then the next one, we're going up to 1985 with Obsession, which I talked about in the Calvin Klein video, so I won't spend too much time. This is a really pretty spicy oriental. Um, the books gave it three stars, and I think it's really pretty, and I think it actually holds up today, and it smells, it doesn't smell new or fresh, but it, it smells classic to me, and um, I'm actually looking forward to wearing this, probably when it gets to be fall. And then I don't have the original Poison, but I do have Pure Poison. So the original Poison came out in 85, actually, the same year as Obsession. So, um, but I have Pure Poison, which I think is fairly similar. Um, Pure Poison came out in 2004, and I really think it's reminiscent of Poison. Poison got five stars, and it's huge tuberose. Reviewing Poison is a bit like road testing an Abrams M1 tank in the evening rush hour. People just seem to get out of your way, and if they don't, you just swivel that turret to remind them you're not kidding. This is the fragrance everybody loves to hate, the beast that defined the 80s, the perfume that cost me a couple of friendships and one good working relationship. It is also unquestionably the best dressed up syrupy tuberose in history, and in my opinion, it buries Amarige and the first Oscar de la Renta in the make it a night he'll never forget category. Every perfume collector has to have this, but please never ever wear it to dinner. So then Pure Poison, it has four stars, Woody Jasmine. With a radiance covering roughly three city blocks, Pure Poison is a no holds barred floral oriental, which feels like its forerunner, Isatis, like a simple tune played on a cathedral organ. This is a massive sweet orange blossom and jasmine affair, plus candied orange peel with a few big woody notes to let people know you mean business. It feels designed for the woman who wears a wonder bra and no discernible blouse under her suit. <laughs> I really like Pure Poison. Um, I remember people wearing Poison back in the 80s and it, <laughs> it was like, get out of my way. I'm coming through with this. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, so, um, the way the book describes it, they're not too similar, but I think, I think it's definitely, uh, very derivative of the original Poison. It's just kind of modernized in my opinion. So I recommend this. And then we're moving up to 1986 with Lady Stetson, which I love. Um, this is so beautiful. And I actually discovered this through these books, um, because I never wore this back in the day, nor do I remember really smelling it, um, under the radar. People don't necessarily know about it and or they do and they kind of brush it off like it's tacky and cheap so lady stetson four stars aldehydic floral really if fragrance like this doesn't make you happy what will aspirational type still buying up chanel number 22 in search of the sweet aldehydic floral of their dreams take note we sprayed lady stetson on one strip number 22 on the other and observe the following while number 22 is heavy immediately with the plush iris that only chanel can afford to use at every opportunity lady stetson sets out on an airy, slightly powdery peach. As time goes on, number 22 gets even sweeter to the point of discomfort while the lady seems to simply relax. It's a well-balanced structure of just enough amber, just enough floral, just enough peach, just enough soapy citrus to pull up a smile each time it comes to your attention. This fragrance smells great without showing off and truth to tell, I prefer it to the Chanel. Now, if only the bottle weren't so hideous. <laughs> so I think this is like a half ounce and I think you can get it on fragrance net for like five bucks. And then I think they have a bigger one too but I agree, it's so pretty and so underrated. So 
that's Lady Stetson. Then in 1987, we have Calyx from Prescriptives at that time and now Clinique. And this is a great fruit, fruit bomb that I love. I've talked about it in several videos and I believe it's pretty well rated in this book. Calyx, five stars, guava rose. Sometimes while reviewing yet another middling batch of perfumes and looking in vain for their reasons for being, I wonder if the problem is me. If critical thought has obliterated pleasure at last and my days as a hedonist, 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 are through. Naturally, the next bottle is always a stunner. Like all Sophia Grossman's works, best works, Calyx is built on a bold, simple structure, fruity with a high profile roll for the deliciously garbagey, overripe smell of guava, plus floral, powdery rose, plus green, neroli, and oak moss. From top to bottom, Calyx maintains its perfect balance between clean crispness and rosy sweetness without ever falling into either camp completely. So they go on and um, I agree, this is so pretty and it's it's very powerful. So it does have that power of the 80s, but it's it's different. And I, I don't ever really smell this when I'm out and about. I wore this a lot when I was a young adult. And um, so this is one of my favorites. And I think I talked about this in my um, four most important fragrances on my perfume journey video, which I'll link up in the cards. So let me know if you've tried this. I love it. And then we have 1988, where we have Calvin Klein Eternity. I talked about this in my Calvin Klein video, so I won't go into it too much, but it is a very beautiful, I think, um, floral, and um, it's very iconic, I think, from, from the time it came out until probably the mid-90s. It's got tons of flankers. I think they still come out with new flankers on this one. So it's good. It's classic. It's very 80s. Um, does it hold up today? It depends. If you like something that's that's kind of um, takes you back to a different time, then you might like this. So um, I, I like it, but I'm personally not planning on wearing this just because I wore this so much back in the day. <laughs> and then I also have Fahrenheit, which I love and also came out in 1988. I believe it didn't get a good review in this book, if I'm not mistaken, but that's okay, I still like it. Woody Leather, two stars. Fahrenheit should now be renamed after another temperature scale, maybe Romer or Rankine, because it is unrecognizable. It used to be a great citrus leather in the manner of Belle Ami, overlaid with the gassiest, hissiest, most diffusive note of violet leaf in all of perfumery. Acetylenic esters have now been severely restricted. Triple bonds smell wonderful, but are chemically reactive. And what's left is a kind of Belle Ami, except that Belle Ami itself has been messed with and Fahrenheit is arguably better than the modern version. Either way, nothing to celebrate. I really like it still. I think it's it's nice. And um, I don't personally wear it, but my husband does. And I think it smells really good. Um, so I don't know, what do you think? What are your favorites from the 80s? I'm definitely interested in hearing that from you, as well as any other video suggestions you have. I would love to hear those too. And thank you so much for being here today. I hope you're doing well and um, staying safe and healthy and all your friends and family are as well. Um, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and feel free to give it a thumbs down if you didn't. Thank you again and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.